for people. <coughs> Giving people lifts and buying them lunch and helping them out is it's really awesome. And in my daydreams, I dream about being able to do something even bigger for people. You know, winning the lottery, which would be a miracle because I don't buy tickets. <laughs> but winning the lottery and being able to take someone on a paradise holiday. Being able to buy them a new car to replace that car that's always breaking down. Settle that debt that they are stressed out about. There's so many awesome things that I would love to do for my friends. And I know it would be so cool because imagine telling someone, hey, you're coming with me to Mauritius. They would be like, yeah. <laughs> And we would be like, ah, oh, best place. And it would be such a cool experience. And I know that I'm not alone in that. I know each one of you identify. Because as many of you who are sitting here have done very cool things for me. It made me feel like that. So I know this is something that we can all relate to. That we love doing things for friends. Helping people. But I think you can also identify with me. When I say all too soon, I realize my limitations. I realize that there are things that I can't do for the people that I love and the people that I'm aware of who have needs. There are people who already go on holidays to Mauritius and have the cars and the houses and, and there's still something missing in their lives. There's some brokenness in a relationship or just deep down where they have a need that isn't being met. And I know that winning the lotto isn't going to be the answer for them. And so, the big question that I want to put in front of you first thing this morning, this afternoon, is what can you do for the friends that you can't do anything for? What can I do for my friends who I can't do anything for? What can you do? For those friends that you can't do anything for. This week and next week is a mini series that I've called Faith That Works. And the first message is entitled Friends. Because we believe that as followers of Jesus, those of you who have made that decision, following Jesus is different to any other way of doing life. It's different to being inspired by Gandhi or Nelson Mandela or following the advice of Tim Robbins or any of the other gurus around because Jesus, who we follow, came not only to save you but also to serve you. He serves you so that in His strength, you, can live that abundant life, which means loving God and serving others. So this is kind of the backdrop to, it's kind of my philosophy of being a follower of Jesus, and so it's going to be the undercurrent to every message that I get inspired to share. But particularly in faith that works, there's some doing words in there, loving and serving. And we're going to explore how we can do being a follower of Jesus with our friends, who are such an important part of our life. And we're going to go to the Gospel of Mark. Now Mark is the second Gospel or story of Jesus in the New Testament. We believe it was probably written by John Mark, who was the young man that accompanied the Apostle Peter on his missionary journeys, spreading the good news and building up the early church. And we can imagine that as John Mark traveled with Peter, and Peter told him all the stories, all the experiences that he had of being with Jesus. John Mark was just inspired, we have to write this down. And so we believe that the Gospel according to Mark is really Peter's experience of being a disciple and a follower of Jesus. And so we start in the second book of Mark, Mark chapter 2, right in the beginning, verse 1. Now the Backstory to this, as you'll see, it says when Jesus returned to Capernaum. So Jesus has 
It's right at the start of his ministry. And he's started to travel from where he grew up in Nazareth throughout the region of Galilee, which surrounds this province that surrounds the Sea of Galilee. And he started preaching and teaching and healing. And he's just blowing up. Everybody is talking about this new teacher that can heal and preaches with such authority. So when Jesus returned to Capernaum, which formed the base of his operations, of his ministry, and it's the area where some of the earliest disciples come from, Peter, James, John, Andrew. When he returns to Capernaum, after traveling through Galilee and preaching and teaching, the news spreads like wildfire. The news spread quickly that he was back home. And soon the house where he was staying, and again, we're not sure from the scriptures, but it could possibly have been Peter's house that Jesus was staying in. And soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. And we'll come to another little hint why it was so packed in a little while. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Four friends who for years and years have seen the devastating effects of a crippling disease on one of their friends, leaving him paralyzed and unable to help himself. These friends bring him to Jesus. While they try, we'll get there. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. You can just imagine Jesus is inside the house, the word is spread through the, the village of Capernaum, which was a small village on the northern shore of, the, of Galilee, of the Sea of Galilee. Maybe about 1,500 inhabitants. But still, it seemed like almost every single one of those 1,500 people were coming to this one house where Jesus was. The inside filled up really quickly. People were standing around the doors and the windows, just straining to hear the word of God that Jesus was sharing. So his friends arrive carrying this cripple on a makeshift bed, most likely a sheepskin, a dried out sheepskin attached to some poles to hold it so that it could so be carried. And they've carried this man from his home to Jesus. But as they get to the house, there's just people, maybe 30, 40 deep, all the way to the door. And because everyone is focused on hearing what Jesus is saying inside, no one really wants to make way for these four guys and this cripple lying in the bed. So his friends don't give up. That's the first lesson to think about when you consider that question. What can you do for the friends that you can't do anything for? In those days, houses were built from, from clay and very rudimentary materials, and they, the roofing structure because it gets really hot in Palestine, was built so that there was either a ladder or some stairs so that you get on top of the roof of the house and on those warm Palestinian nights, sleep up there in slightly cooler conditions than inside the very stuffy house. The roof was made from packed clay bricks, often mixed with manure and other substances to just make sure they set well. And maybe sometimes they had some stone tiles as well to hold it all down. But none of that stopped the cripple's friends. They hauled him, hoisted him, got him onto the top of the roof somehow, and then they started pulling off the tiles and digging through this clay material to get their friend to Jesus. And then once they made the hole big enough, they lowered this man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. They persevered. They didn't give up. They made sure that they got their friend right into the presence of Jesus. Jesus looks at this man lying, helpless, paralyzed in front of him. Maybe he glances up at those four or more faces staring down from the roof, a few bits of straw and clay still dropping from the hole that they've made. 
and seeing the faith that has brought them to that place. Understanding the faith that this man has had, he says, my child, young man, your sins are forgiven. There's two reasons why Jesus says this. Maybe there's more. There's two reasons that I can think of. The first one is confirmed by Ellen White when she, under inspiration, writes in the book, Desire of Ages, about this cripple. She describes how, through a life of sin, he had contracted this disease, and it had slowly crippled him. But worse than the physical effects of his disease was the knowledge and the crushing weight of the sin that he bore. He'd been to doctors to try and help him, to cure him of his paralysis without any luck. He'd also been to the priests, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, to beg for forgiveness of his sins, to ask for their help in putting him right with God again so that maybe God in his mercy would remove this physical affliction. But the more years went by that he suffered, the more he desired to be relieved, not so much from his physical symptoms, but from the burden of sin. She writes, if he could see Jesus and receive the assurance of forgiveness and peace with heaven, he would die content. He would be content to live or die according to God's will. The cry of the dying man was, oh, that I might come into his presence. And I believe, knowing the people that I know, living the life that I've lived, that underneath a lot of the things that we struggle with is this call. Oh, that I might come into the presence of Jesus, that I might be forgiven and set free. Back to the story of Mark, and here comes the second reason I believe that Jesus, instead of just saying, you healed, get up and walk, said to this man, your sins are forgiven. Because you see, there were some teachers of the religious law who were sitting there. And just remember, this is a house that is packed and crowded, you know, standing room only, except for the elite. The teachers of the religious law. Now, if you've read much in the Gospels, you might have heard some of these terms. Teachers of the law, priests, Pharisees, Sadducees. And each of these groups, they're different, but could form overlapping functions. So in other words, a priest could be a Pharisee, or from the Sadducees. All of them could be teachers of the law. But a Pharisee could not be a Sadducee. You've got to keep those two separate, right? The way I remember it is, the Sadducees were from the higher classes in society. They believed in the written word of God at the time, the Torah, and they rejected the oral traditions that had been built up and were especially encouraged by the Pharisees. So the Sadducees believed in the Torah, and the one key theological difference they had with the Pharisees was they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So the easy way to remember that is they didn't believe in life after death, so they were sad, you see. <laughs> the Sadducees. The Pharisees came more from the middle classes, and their mission was to make sure that everyone in the nation was acceptable to God and lived right. And that's why they built up this incredibly long list of behavioral standards, do's and don'ts, and they were very busy looking around to make sure that everyone was following this list of behaviors to be acceptable to God. So they were Pharisees far, I see. I see far. I can see what you're doing. Okay, that's just me. It's a bad thing. Sadducees and Pharisees. So these 
Pharisees and teachers of a religious law were threatened by Jesus. Somebody who'd come and totally shaken up their idea of what serving God, obeying God, and being part of the church should look like. Here was someone who was preaching freedom, associating with people that were clearly cursed by God, such as the cripple being lowered into their presence. And so in the house, they were sitting on one side, never mind that there wasn't room for many people. They took the space to sit, facing Jesus as he talked. And Jesus knew he needed to establish his authority at the start of his ministry. He needed to proclaim, to fulfill prophecy, Isaiah and others, that he was the Son of God. So these teachers of the law say to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. But Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Why do you question that I can forgive sins? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? This question isn't easier. It's always puzzled me. Because, well, it depends. And the way I'd like to explain it to you is it depends on your perspective. From God's perspective, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up, pick up your mat and walk? God is the creator of the universe, the creator of the designer of the human body. For him to say, let's just fix whatever's wrong in this cripple. Let's just move those cells around, reconnect those nerves. That was easy for God. For God to say, your sins are forgiven, cost the life of his son. From a human perspective, what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven because, I mean, <laughs> how can you prove one way or the other? Whether you're right. But for a, from a human perspective to say to a cripple who's been crippled for years, get up, pick up your mat and walk, that is really difficult. So Jesus is asking his audience, the teachers of the law, the people around that can hear him, think carefully about your question. Think carefully about your doubts about who I am. He says to them, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. This phrase, the Son of Man, is an echo of a term used in Daniel to describe the Messiah. And so Jesus states his claim. He identifies himself in words and then in actions. He turns to the paralyzed man and says, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. These are people who had not yet been witness to Jesus' miracle-working power. They knew the man. And when he gets up, picks up his mat, the crowds part in absolute amazement as he walks out of the house. And I bet, I don't know how tall the house was, but those four friends maybe jumped off the roof and there were high fives and hugs and just incredible joy as the faith of those four friends was rewarded in such an incredible way because they knew their friend. They were really happy that he was standing on his feet and he was walking and he was no longer ill. But most of all, they were happy because when they looked into his eyes, they saw peace. They saw the kind of peace that you can't get just from being physically healed. They saw the peace that you can't get just from knowing that you don't owe a huge amount of money or that your car's going to break down. They saw the peace of someone who has met God. 
and not being rejected, but being completely accepted with what is sin and being forgiven. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. You see, faith, as a description of being a follower of Jesus, must be something that works. It must be something that can make a difference in your life and in the lives of your friends. The InterVarsity Press Bible Comment, New Testament Commentary describes it like this. Faith is not simply working up a feeling or suppressing doubts, but it's demonstrating commitment to getting to the one on whose power we stake our trust. Demonstrating commitment. Those friends came and they told the cripple, Jesus heals. And Jesus forgives. And then they demonstrated that commitment by bringing their friend into the presence of Jesus. And so if we want to have that experience, if we want to experience true joy with our friends, what can you do? I want you to think about your friends. I want to think about yourself. If you haven't decided to be a fully committed follower of Jesus, there's a different answer to the question of what can you do. But if you have decided, and you're all in, then what can you do to the people that are in your life, at home, your children, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your colleagues at work, your friends? What can you do? And then, even more importantly, what can we do? As the body of Christ, as people who together have come in our brokenness and in our weakness so that we can be made strong together, what can we do? Research isn't the be all and end all, but it is a good indicator of things that work. And it's been shown that people who can come into a church community and, and know at least four other people have a much higher chance of staying and feeling part and belonging in that community. So what can we do when we see someone new? Go and make friends. When you are going to invite your colleague to come to church, tell a few of your other friends and say, hey, reach out. Next week, we'll explore even more what we can do together for our friends. But for now, I want you to just take this thought away. The question, what can you do for your friends that you can't do anything for, is bring them to Jesus. Don't try and fix them. Don't try and give them the message that they have to sort out a whole bunch of stuff before they can come to church, before they can get on their knees and meet Jesus. Just bring them into His presence. Because you're bringing them into the presence of the one who said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. That is exactly what Jesus did for you. And that is exactly what he will do for all of your friends.